Walter Roberts Endowment for putting this on and for GW inviting me uh, to talk about uh, public diplomacy. My remarks will be a little bit more brief. I uh, look forward to having a, a Q&A uh, session afterwards. I came here really to make three points about challenges that I see for public diplomacy. Um, but first, I just want to quickly orient you with the work that we do at IIP and what that means. Many of you are probably quite familiar with it. Um, I've been at the State Department for three years, and uh, prior to joining State, I worked at the White House, where I was the uh, director of the Office of Digital Strategy, and I worked on the 2008 campaign for President Obama. So I've been with the administration from the beginning, and at this point, planning to stay until the last day. We'll see how that goes. Um, at, a, at the State Department, I manage this bureau that sits in between the Bureau of Public Affairs and the Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs as part of the our family. We report to the Undersecretary of Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs. And IIP historically was part of USIA in the great merger, um, became a bureau that I never really understood until I'd been there for a year or two was not something that the rest of the department had really incorporated, um, I think, or quite organically into it, their operations. And so over the last three years, and a little bit longer, we spent a lot of time trying to do almost internal business development having to work with traditional diplomats in the regional bureaus and other parts to incorporate public diplomacy into the way that they approach their work. And that is very much in line with how President Obama sees public diplomacy. Uh, shortly after I took, a, took the position, he gave a speech at West Point where he really summed up what I think public diplomacy means and hopefully what he thinks it means, where he said that the United States doesn't just build alliances with other countries, that we build alliances with ordinary people. And I take that to mean alliances being purpose-driven networks, that we're not just trying to make people like us, we're trying to get something done, collaborating with other people. We're trying to find allies who are non-government actors. Uh, and that's really where I've tried to lead IIP in terms of being a resource to our colleagues in the field uh, at different embassies around the world. And along those lines, we've thought a lot about digital strategy, what the impact of social media means. And the way that I think about it uh, is that oftentimes social media is seen as another version of traditional media, meaning that um, you know it used to be easy to do a 60-minute TV uh, video and you'd put it out there and people would watch it. Or you could get an article and it'd be on the front page of the paper and everyone would see it. It was a more defined information space and you could tell what the dominant narratives were gonna be. Now it's much wider and less controllable. And I think that that's true. But in the context of public diplomacy, I think the larger question is, uh, for your digital strategy, how, has, how have connection technologies affected the societies you're trying to engage? Meaning that people can connect more easily and get information more easily than they ever have before. I thought that the uh, chart that uh, Robert had, the very last one, that talked about the target nation's media it's a very interesting way of putting it because the effect of social media in many ways is that it creates a sort of separate um, alternative media um, in countries that have historically had state-controlled media or very tightly regulated media. And you end up actually having two uh, uh, areas where these conversations are happening. And those are the challenges that governments are facing, large institutions are facing. Uh, they're sometimes not as necessary. They're oftentimes not as in control. and. In a lot of places, the tricks they've been up to for a long time are becoming pretty clear, and they're threatened by a citizenry that's not too happy with it. And that's the world we find ourselves in right now. There's three challenges at state, I think, for realizing the opportunity, uh, what public diplomacy can bring. The first is thinking about our policy in terms of objectives. And to me, this is the most basic level. Uh, this has been a huge frustration for me. We were in the State Department, I get there three years ago, brand new suit, I even got a new tie. I walk around and they, people say, we need, we're gonna do something about climate change. We need to promote entrepreneurship. And I was like, that sounds great. I can get on board, what does that mean? Where, which country, what, and what does success look like? Um, when it comes to public diplomacy, we tend to sort of talk about topics, not stories. We, we, we say, oh, these are our strengths, and we want to get out there and get the good word out, rather than saying, we need the government here to actually have this behavior change. We want to see this measurable outcome, and we think public diplomacy can help. Uh, and until we start thinking about foreign policy in terms of achievable objectives, it's going to be very difficult, uh, I think, to have real strategic programs. 
Um, my origin experience was on the presidential campaign. Pretty clear outcome there, right? Get more votes than the other person, or more votes via the Electoral College, you, you know what I'm saying, okay? You know, we knew that and we would reverse engineer back. That's why we didn't do a lot of organizing in Alabama. I'm from Alabama, right? Uh, we need to uh, take this kind of strategic approach to achieving our goals through public diplomacy. Uh, one of my colleagues, who's a career civil servant, uh, did one of these roundtables with Secretary Kerry, where he wants to hear from the front line, and he asked, what's public diplomacy in the 21st century mean to you? And she said, sir, we're moving from an era where we're telling people the things they need to know to telling people the things they need to do. And I couldn't have said it better myself. So the second piece of that, uh, once we've identified our objectives, is really identifying and engaging priority audiences around those objectives. Looking at a country and its non-state actors and realizing that not all are created equal. That sometimes our best allies and the people who love to come to our parties are actually kind of useless in the country. <laughs> and the ones that we actually need to influence don't like us, and it's hard. And we need to figure out a path to get to them through intermediaries because they are influential. So mapping out that landscape, on one hand, requires just some old, old school politics, knowing who's important, who's not. But there's so many other tools coming online right now through social media monitoring, influence monitoring, things that we're trying to drive. And we can talk about the Privacy Act, but there's not enough alcohol here. Um, <laughs> but there are tools coming online that will make it much easier to understand the nature of influence, to understand how to prioritize our outreach. But we need to be thinking more strategically about the audiences relevant to those objectives and how we identify them and how we engage them. And finally, and this is the part that I think is, is just an outrageous problem um, at the State Department because our rhetoric does not meet the reality, is that we need to maintain relationships in much, much better than we do. We are really good at check the box relationship, come to our 4th of July party. Or we're gonna have a, a reception for our um, you know, different fellowship programs or what have you. That's great, you know, it's good to have the Fulbrights get together. We have tens of thousands of alumni from exchange programs around the world in, in every country. And in, in any country where we have a policy objective we wanna get done, we need to consider them, as President Obama said, allies, not just alumni. And our systems for maintaining these relationships are atrocious, if existent at all. So again, I could talk about IT at the State Department. We would need even more alcohol, but we're not gonna do that, okay? But I think from a challenge, just a basic challenge standpoint, introducing the longitudinal aspect of relationship and trust building uh, into our public diplomacy uh, activities is gonna be something that's new for a lot of PD practitioners. Um, I'm okay on time? Yeah, you've okay. got two minutes. <laughs> Finally, two, uh, two hot-button things that I just wanted to, so those are my three, most of those are my three challenges. First, we need to define our objectives clearly so that people outside of the State Department can understand what the hell we're trying to do and how they can plug in. Is that violent agreement or disagreement? Yes? No? Okay. Um, we need to identify the priority audiences around those uh, objectives and engage them and we need to maintain relationships over time so that we build trust. Because I don't know if you've read anything lately, trust in white guys in suits from the government is kind of going right? We need to figure out how we can build relationships um, uh, over time. So the two hot button things, one, countering disinformation. Other people can talk about that, lots of people working on it. My one thought on this, because it's certainly a challenge, is there is a war on information. There is a rising level of cynicism we cannot have our strategy start with the word counter. Then we are accepting our opponent's strategy. We need to think about the audiences that matter to us based on our policy objectives and pursue an inoculation strategy to build trust before the crap comes over the, over the wall. Some people will be disinformed, and that's too bad. But the people that matter to us based on our policy goals need to have a relationship that's pre-existing with the United States or our allies so that they are more resistant to this kind of, this kind of stuff. Second thing, and this is for a whole nother, whole nother thing, a whole nother uh, conference. Those of you who know state will, I think, track this pretty well. We need to clarify the difference between public diplomacy and development. Cutting grants to teach English is awesome. Super, super psyched about it. 
cutting grants to wannabe entrepreneurs to start their programs, whatever, cool, all right? That's not winning a policy objective for the United States in the next six months. And unless you can map it back to that, USAID should do it. We should think about ECA having a more clear role on that, but we shouldn't muddle it with our week-to-week, month-to-month outside game to win it inside game uh, outcomes. And I think there's a lot of foreign service officers who are kind of working out their Peace Corps issues, <laughs> right, because they got kicked out, uh, who, want to make, who genuinely do want to make the world a better place, and they meet people who are amazing, people around the world, and they want to help them. That's not public diplomacy. And I think at the end of the day, we have to be able to work back our public engagement efforts to specific goals that advance US interests. And I worry a little bit that that line gets, gets muddled. But hopefully we can talk about more of this in the q and I just want to, again, thank you for inviting me here to, uh, to say a few words. And I should say, as, the, as we meet the end of the administration, the last three years have been by far the most eye-opening learning experience of my life. The State Department is an incredible place to work, and I just am very humbled and honored to have had this opportunity. So thank you very much.